Hello everyone and thanks for watching Edipedia World Videos. In this video we will talk about a special type of material called dielectrics and these materials are often used to increase the capacitance of a capacitor. So first let's look at a little bit of what we saw in the previous video. Whenever we have an insulator, let's take a rectangular slab of the insulator. And we put it inside an electric field E. This is true for conductors as well. Conductors it happens to an ideal degree. Insulators it happens to an imperfect degree. If we put this insulator or this dielectric in an electric field E, then there will be some charges induced on the surface of this dielectric. So generally molecules are, have a certain dipole moment and molecules with a dipole moment are called polar molecules. And polar molecules would be represented like this, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So each of these molecules has a dipole moment P. And remember we've talked about dipole moment before and the direction of dipole moment is from negative to positive. Now we saw in electrostatics that whenever we have a dipole and it is kept in a uniform electric field, it will experience a torque which will try to align it parallel to the electric field. Given enough time, all these dipoles will actually be arranged in the direction of the electric field. So initially they were all random, finally these would not be there, they would be tilted and finally most of the molecules would be something like this. Minus plus, minus plus, minus plus. Now you might be wondering what about molecules which do not have a dipole moment. So consider something like this. If you have a molecule, let's say a molecule like this which does not have any dipole moment and you keep it in an electric field, every molecule contains protons, neutrons and electrons and protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged. So what happens is the protons might move slightly towards the right, the movement is quite small and the electrons will move towards the left and that movement will be somewhat larger because electrons are more mobile. So it will create a positive charge at this end and a negative charge at this end. Now this molecule was initially completely uh, non-polar to begin with, non-polar molecule meaning it did not have a dipole moment. But even non-polar molecules when kept in an electric field end up having a dipole moment simply because of the effect of the electric field and this dipole moment is called induced dipole moment. Typically the magnitude of induced dipole moment is smaller than the magnitude of actual dipole moment of molecules. So the effect will be smaller but the same effect will be valid for non-polar molecules as well, the effect I am talking about right now. So let's look at this in a little bit detail what happens once these molecules are aligned parallel to the electric field. If you have any trouble remembering why they align, I suggest you go back and look at the video on dipoles. In that we calculate the torque on a dipole kept in a uniform electric field and we find out the torque is such that it always tries to align the dipole parallel to the electric field. So let's say we have lots of dipoles, all the molecules have aligned parallel to the electric field, minus plus, minus plus, minus plus, minus plus, minus plus, minus plus, yeah. So what will happen is, if you take any small region, these positive and these negative charges neutralize, so any small region within the dielectric will still remain electrically neutral. But if you look at this edge, there will be an accumulation of negative charges at this edge, so this edge will have a negative surface charge density. And similarly, this right edge will have a positive surface charge density. And since the dielectric as a whole was electrically neutral to begin with, those two will be equal. We will name them sigma p and minus sigma p. Uh, sigma p is called p because it is due to the polarization but generally whenever you have charges accumulating on a surface as a result of putting a dielectric in an electric field the charges are called induced charges. You can see a, a similar terminology. Induced means it was not already there but because we put the material in, ele in an electric field, the electric field made this happen. They are also sometimes called bound charges. 
and these charges will create an electric field in the opposite direction. The negative charges will create an electric field towards them, the positive charges will create an electric field away from them. And what will happen is, if the material is perfectly conducting, then this, because there is uh, no, uh, in, uh, no limitation on the number of free charges available in a conductor, this just process will keep on happening until this electric field towards the left side matches the magnitude of the electric field towards the right side which was outside. And so the net electric field inside the conductor will be zero. What happens in dielectrics is they are not perfect conductors so there will be a surface charge density but it will not be enough to neutralize this electric field completely. So, so if I draw this dielectric here again. Within the dielectric, there is an electric field E towards the right. And if it was a conductor, there would have been an electric field E towards the left, which would have been the induced electric field due to these induced charges. But if it's not a conductor but a dielectric, there will be a field, but it will be smaller in magnitude than the original field. Let's call it EP, right, electric field due to polarization. Let's call this E0, just for the sake of simplicity. Right, so E0 was the electric field, constant electric field in which I put the dielectric. EP was the electric field due to polarization or the induced electric field in the opposite direction. And the net electric field will be a little bit towards the right. Let's call it E. And it will be the resultant of these two. So the result we will get is E vector is equal to E0 vector plus EP vector. The direction of EP is opposite to E0 and the net electric field will still be towards the right. Now, the extent to which this electric field inside can be neutralized is the strength of how conducting a material is in one way. There are other ways to measure it as well. So, what we will say is, if the electric field is reduced by a factor k, then k is called the dielectric constant of that material. So, the definition of dielectric constant is E, magnitude E is equal to E0 by k. Yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, K is 1 for air or vacuum and K is infinity for conductors. Because if we don't put anything here, then e EP will simply be 0 and E will be equal to E0. There will be no neutralizing field in the opposite direction. That means K is 1. If, there, if it is a conductor, then E will be equal to 0 because EP will be equal and opposite to E0. If E is 0, that means K is infinity. So the higher the dielectric constant of a material, the closer it is to a conductor. Now there is another quantity which is of interest when we talk about dielectrics in an electric field and that quantity is called polarization. Now I don't want you to confuse this with the dipole moment. The dipole moment is represented by small p, polarization is represented by capital P and it is defined as the dipole moment per unit volume. So if we have negative charges and a surface charge density minus sigma p on the left side, and positive charges and the surface charge density sigma p on the right side, what would be the dipole moment of this particular um, object? The dipole moment is simply the charge multiplied by the distance between them. The let's say the area of cross section is A and this distance is L, the charge on this surface will be sigma p times A because sigma p is the surface charge density, right, charge per unit area. The charge on this surface will be minus sigma p A. And that is the valid criteria for a dipole. You have equal and opposite charges on both sides. So the charge will be sigma p a and the distance between them is L. So this is the dipole moment of this extended object. What is the volume of this object? A times L. So if you divide it by the volume, what you left with is sigma p. And we get a nice result that the polarization or dipole moment per unit volume has a magnitude which is equal to the induced surface charge density. So let's look at what happens when we insert a dielectric into a capacitor. Again, as usual, we'll be dealing with parallel plate capacitors. So we have a parallel plate capacitor, this side has a charge, Q, this side has a charge, minus Q. And we insert a dielectric in between it 
and I'm just showing a gap for the sake of convenience, actually we'll assume that the width of the dielectric is the same as the distance between the plates of the capacitor. So this is the dielectric, let's say it has a dielectric constant k. So because there is a, a charges equal and opposite on both sides, what will happen is there will be an electric field between these two plates. Let's say this area is A and this distance is L. The electric field between the two plates will be sigma by 2 epsilon naught due to this one and sigma by 2 epsilon naught due to this one. So the net electric field in the right, E, will be equal to sigma by epsilon naught. That is Q by A epsilon naught. Because Q is equal to, uh, because sigma is equal to Q by A. Now there will be an opposite electric field Ep due to induced charges. So let's deal with the induced charges. We know that this side will have negative charges and this side will have positive charges because the electric field is from the left to right. So let's say there will be negative charges here and let's say that charges, the magnitude of the charge is equal minus Qp and next to the negative minus Q, you'll have a positive Qp. Right. So the we can write E is equal to Q by A epsilon naught. Simply, uh, similarly, we can write E P is equal to Q P by A epsilon naught. So what we will get is uh, the net electric field towards the right. This is E naught. Sorry, the net electric field towards the right E will be Q minus Q P by A epsilon. Naught. Right. But we already know what this electric field should be. It should be equal to E naught by K. Right? That is the definition of the dielectric constant. What is E naught? It is Q by A epsilon naught. So Q by A epsilon naught. A epsilon naught, A epsilon naught cancel and the result I get is QP is equal to Q times 1 minus 1 by K. So this is the amount of induced charges that are present on the dielectric. We can see that if k is equal to 1, in that case qp will be 0 and that is vacuum. If there is no vacuum, they will. if there is no dielectric is completely vacuum, qp will be 0 and there will be no induced surface charges because there is nothing, there are no free charges to induce the charges on. If k is equal to infinity, then qp is equal to q. k is equal to infinity means a conductor. In that case, QP will be exactly be equal to Q and this charge will exactly be the opposite of this charge making sure that the electric field inside will be zero. So we see the dielectrics are sort of between nothing being there, vacuum being there and a pure conductor being there which neutralizes the electric field completely. Now what effect does this have on the capacitance? So let's say initially the capacitance was Q by V because the potential difference between these was V. That, that was when the electric field was E0. If the electric field becomes E, then the potential difference will change. We know that V is equal to minus integral of E dot dr, which means in this case because everything is constant, it is proportional to E. So earlier it was Q by V, C nu will be Q by the new electric field, the new potential and the new potential will be proportional to the new electric field. If the original electric field E0 is Q by A epsilon naught and the new electric field E is Q by A epsilon naught K that means the voltage must be reduced by a factor of K as well right if the electric field here is reduced by a certain amount V is integral of E dot dr that means it is equal to E to L in this case so it will also be reduced by a factor of K so we will get V by K K goes up which gives us K Q by V so the result we get is C nu is equal to K times C volt. So that means if a capacitor has a certain capacitance and you introduce within that capacitor a dielectric of dielectric constant 5, then the capacitance will become 5 times of its original value. Every time we insert a dielectric into a capacitor, the capacitance, the capacitance increases by the amount of the dielectric constant. If the dielectric constant is 12, then the capacitance will be 12 times its original value. So this is a this is where we see one of the uses of dielectrics. We know that capacitors are generally used to store energy, and the energy stored in a capacitor is proportional to half cv square. It is half cv square actually. The energy density is proportional to this. And if we can just simply insert a material into the capacitor to increase its capacitance, then we can increase the amount of energy stored in that capacitor. 
So it is a much more efficient capacitor in that sense. Now one important thing here is that we assume the dielectric had the width equal to the distance between the plates. So this region was pretty much negligible. However, if that is not true, then it will be easy enough. So I'll take two cases and you'll just understand all the problems from these two cases. Let's say these are my parallel plates, Q and minus Q, and I insert a dielectric with a width half of the distance between the capacitors. So this half is dielectric of dielectric constant K, this half is K is equal to 1 because it's vacuum. What will be the new capacitance? So that's easy enough because of this charge, there will be some induced charges here which will result in some induced charges here and what you can do is you can assume that these are two capacitors which are kept in series. So this is one capacitor which is kept in series with another capacitor. So you calculate the capacitance of the first capacitor, you calculate the capacitance of the second capacitor and because they are kept in series you can use the standard series formula. You could also have a case like this in which these are your parallel plates and instead of the dielectric covering the whole area, the dielectric covers the upper or the lower part. In that case again you can treat it as two capacitors. This is the first capacitor and this is the second capacitor and both these capacitors have the same potential difference between them because they might be connected to a battery. So you can just assume this to be two separate capacitors which are in parallel. So one of them will have a, for example if the total capacitance was C, this will be C by 2, this will be C by 2. When you insert a dielectric of dielectric constant K, this becomes KC by 2. And then you can simply add them up because in parallel for capacitors you can add it. So the net capacitance will be C by 2 times 1 plus K. If K was 1, it would still be C. If K is more than 1, it will be more than C. Right? So this is how you can calculate the capacitance of different capacitors when dielectrics in different combinations are inserted inside them. This concept of dielectrics also allows us to see of an alternative form of Gauss law which is quite important. So in this, what the problem I have with the standard Gauss law is, it assumes that, sorry it doesn't assume, it says that E dot ds is equal to Q enclosed by epsilon naught. Now the problem is Q enclosed in, is generally quite a difficult quantity to find out. For example, if these are my capacitors and I insert a plate between them, I, I apologize for the figure. And if this is my Gaussian surface, then Q enclosed will inclu include this surface charge density and this induced surface charge density as well. And as we change the dielectrics, the induced surface charge density might change, which means the total charge enclosed will change. So we would like, if possible, to have a Gauss law in which the right hand side does not in involve Q enclosed, it involves this Q which is what which is what we would call from now on Q free. Q free are the free charges that are simply charges which are not bound. So and before this chapter everything we heard of as Q will from now on be referred to as Q free. It is, it is the thing that we can control. We can give a certain amount of charge to a plate. So that will be referred to as the free charge. The moment we give a certain amount of charge to this plate, this end will have an induced surface charge density. And if we take the total Q, that is the sum of these two, there is no reason to leave this one out. Right, whenever you are applying Gauss law, you need to include the total charge within the Gaussian surface. So, to calculate Q enclosed every time would be quite tedious. Instead, we would like some form of Gauss law in which the answer only depends on the free charges and we are not concerned with bound charges at all. So, that's what happens and that's what we will need to do now. So, so let's say I will go back to my original question. This is my capacitor. I have inserted a dielectric between them. Q minus QP. Right. Let's say this is taken to be the Gaussian surface. Right. So what will happen is the electric field here will be in this direction. The electric field here will be, will be in this direction. And we will apply Gauss law to this surface. Now actually in this case what would be easier would be because this to calculate the electric field on this side we would have to calculate the charges on every side. Instead what we can do is because every surface actually is not a surface it is a three dimensional object. We can include the thickness of these parallel plate capacitors and the Gaussian surface can actually terminate within the conductor because we know the electric field there is zero. So this is a sort of trick we have done 
in choosing the Gaussian surface. We could have chosen that Gaussian surface as well and the answer would have come the same. I suggest you try it at home if you want. So this is the Gaussian surface we will choose. Right. So the electric field on this side is zero. The electric field here is towards the right. So to through, through the bottom and the top the electric, the electric flux will be zero. The only electric flux will be through this area and that we can call as E times A if E is the electric field here. That is equal to Q by epsilon naught. But Q is the total charge, that is Q minus QP by epsilon naught. Right? We know that QP is equal to Q times 1 minus 1 by K. So if you put that in this equation, Q minus QP will be Q by K. So what I'll get is E into A is equal to Q by K epsilon naught. Now remember, Q minus QP is the total charge enclosed. Q is only the free charge, the charge which I control. I do not control the bound charges. They respond to the free charges. The free charges are what I control. And if you take K towards the right, you get another form of Gauss law. And I write it in the proper form this time. Integral of K times E dot ds is equal to Q free by epsilon. The original form of Gauss law was integral of E dot ds is equal to Q total by epsilon naught. Q total means Q minus Q. Now we know that whenever we insert a dielectric, the charge decreases because there is an opposite induced charge. So if we decrease Q free to the actual total Q, then we have to decrease this K so that it matches the original value. That's basically what we have done. Instead of the original E dot ds, now the electric field will be smaller than the original value. So for that, we have to compensate by adding another k which is larger than 1. Right. So these are two separate forms of Gauss law. You can use either one but whenever we are talking about dielectrics the second one is preferred because on the RHS all we have is the free charges, the charges which we control, the charges which we put on an object. Remember everything you studied up till now was free charges and this is the first video in which we included bound charges. So the moment you include bound charges every charge which is not bound will be called a free charge and the total charge will be the sum of the free and bound charge. There is actually a third form of Gauss law as well which is quite useful and it includes a concept which we, which we just learned called polarization. So we saw what polarization was, dipole moment per unit volume and if this side has minus sigma, let's just call it minus sigma now, if this side has sigma then the polarization is equal to sigma, the magnitude is equal to sigma, the direction is from negative to positive. Right. The electric field here however will be from positive to negative and the magnitude of the electric field will be sigma by epsilon naught. Right. This is Ep, the electric field due to polarization. So I can also write the electric field due to polarization in terms of the vector as minus P by epsilon naught. Minus because it's in the opposite direction and the magnitude is equal to sigma by epsilon naught and we've already proved sigma is equal to p. So what we can write from that is we know the net electric field is equal to the original electric field plus the polarization electric field. If E p is equal to minus p by epsilon naught, we can just substitute it here. E p naught sorry minus p by epsilon naught. Uh, just a little bit of rearrangement and we get epsilon naught E naught is equal to epsilon naught E plus P. Now epsilon naught E plus P is a special quantity which is labeled as T and it is called the electric displacement vector. And we already know what is integral of epsilon naught E naught. We know integral of E naught ds is equal to q free by epsilon naught. Right, so taking epsilon naught to the right side, integral of this into ds will be q free. So from that we get the third and final form of Gauss law, integral of d dot ds is equal to q free. This form of Gauss law is not really quite useful to you right now. But these concepts of electric displacement vector are much more useful as you move higher up. So it's useful to learn this now. But for you, the first and second form of Gauss law will generally be most widely used. Uh, there's one small thing left in this video, 
and that's a couple of definitions basically. So we know that epsilon naught is called relative uh, is called permittivity of free space. And k is directly constant, but it is also sometimes called relative permittivity. And epsilon naught k is called permittivity. And it is labeled as epsilon naught. So, sorry, labeled as epsilon, there is no naught. If there is a naught, then it means it is a free space. For any other, we multiply it by the dielectric constant or relative permittivity. Why is that important? So, for example, if you have a point charge Q and it is kept in a dielectric material of dielectric constant K, right? So, you want to find the electric field a distance R away. What do you do? You apply Gauss law. And in this case, we know Q, there will be some bound charges on the inside. So, we use the second form of Gauss law, which will tell us that K into E into 4 pi R square will be Q by epsilon naught. From that, we get E is equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught K Q by R square. And we can write this as 1 by 4 pi epsilon q by r square. So now you see the meaning of these definitions. Anytime we are working in a dielectric, we can basically replace epsilon naught by epsilon naught multiplied by the relative permittivity or net epsilon, which will be the permittivity of that material. Every material has its own permittivity, which is the permittivity of free space multiplied by the dielectric constant. It's just a way of making it easier. We could just as easily have written 1 by 4 epsilon naught k all throughout. But if we see epsilon naught k again and again, and it is the same quantity for the same material, because k is the same for the same material and epsilon naught is a universal constant, then we can write it as 1 by 4 pi epsilon q by r square. We see that it is smaller than the original value 1 by 4 by epsilon naught q by r squared if there was no dielectric that's because if there's a dielectric then negative charges will be induced on this surface and they will cancel out some of the electric field that's what dielectrics do this completes the topic of dielectrics and capacitors in the next next unit we'll start a new topic which will be current electricity thank you